here you go. Yeah, uh, I think that's recording now. Cool. Okay, so I'd like to start with um, acknowledgement of country. Uh, on behalf of Ladies at UX Melbourne, uh, I acknowledge that although we are scattered throughout Melbourne and beyond, we are all on, on traditional land. Uh, many of us will be on the lands of the Wurrung and Bunurung language groups of the Greater South Central and Eastern Kulin Nations. I pay respects to the elders, past, present, and importantly, the emerging leaders, as well as any other First Nations people present today. The heart of the Ladies at UX community is driven by the desire to connect and build something um, together, be it shared knowledge, shared inspiration, or shared networks. Uh, whether it's in person or from afar, the first peoples of this country have, have had the same desire to con connect and it's seen and felt through their spiritual relationship with Mother Earth, the way they pass on knowledge through storytelling and their efforts to communicate from afar using smoke signals. So as we connect tonight, um, let us remember that there is so much we can learn from the communities around us, especially those that have been here before us. So, um, who is Ladies at UX? Uh, we are a global meetup group that started in Manchester, UK in um, 2013. So the Melbourne chapter actually started in 2014. And our purpose is to provide a platform for women identifying and non-binary folks to speak, facilitate and share their knowledge. Uh, we are committed to creating a safe and inclusive space um, for all folks in the UX community and we don't tolerate discrimination of any kind. So we ask that by attending our events, you'll observe our code of conduct and that's linked in the chat and um, you can find it on our, our meetup page as well. Um, just some housekeeping. So please keep yourself on mute if you're not speaking. Um, again, the session will be recorded. It is being recorded right now. That's the link to, the, to our code of conduct and the, also the code for the Slido is here as well that we'll be using for questions. Uh, thanks to our sponsors tonight, so Adobe XD and Victoria Uni. Um, we actually have a special prize to give away from Adobe XD uh, to the person that asks the best question tonight. So make sure you get onto Slido um, and ask your questions. So, um, designing a virtual job hunt. So I gave you a quick overview of the speakers before. Um, so, we're really excited to hear from them today. And um, without any further ado, I'll pass on to Berlin. Awesome. Hello, everyone. Radio, I'm going to share my screen. Awesome. I take you can see that. Yep. Amazing. Cool. Thank you so much, Ever, and welcome to my flash talk, which is networking in the new normal. My name is Berlin, like the city, and I'm a UX designer at Belong, which is Australia's first carbon neutral telco. I am also a co-organizer with Ever here um, at Ladies That UX Melbourne. If you're wondering why I'm speaking about networking today, the funnest fact I can give is that my number one Gallup strength is WU, which stands for winning others over. Basically, I really enjoy making friends with strangers and creating a connection with people. I have in the past made friends with people on public transport and online on social media. So I recognize that it might be an extreme case and not everyone um, likes the idea of meeting or talking to strangers and that's totally okay. But I'm going off an assumption here that we all understand, you know, that networking comes with its benefits, um, which is why people always say, you should network, it's so good for you and ready ra. So I've looked within and analyzed my strength um, in relation to networking and today, I'll provide some actionable tips on how you can network remotely without feeling icky about it. So we'll cover this through um, four aspects, looking within and identifying your purpose for networking, how to approach someone you don't know online, how to set up a virtual catch up, and what to talk about. All right, first up, looking within and identifying your purpose for networking. This is so important and yet I find a lot of people tend to skip this because it's hard. And you know what? It's, it's meant to be really hard. But as Abraham Lincoln you know, once said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four sharpening an axe. It's the same thing with networking. 
the key to making networking less confusing, gross, awkward, artificial is to dig deep and be true and genuine to yourself and know why you want to do it. So first up, ask yourself, why? Why are you doing it? In fact, ask yourself five times. I mean, we do this in our interviews and in our user testing sessions. So this is the time to do it on yourself. Find out what your root cause is and own it. And then identify the goals behind that. So there could be more goals than what I've listed out here, but I've got five to you know, give you some ideas. Um, it could be to confirm your understanding about something. It could be to expand your knowledge and plunge deeper into a topic. It could be about improving an understanding and clarifying something. Or it could be about learning new ideas and new ways of thinking. Or it could also just simply be to make a new connection and that is that. Something to note here, if getting a job is one of your goals, I think that is when networking becomes icky because getting a job through networking is better viewed as a byproduct of networking than an actual goal. You get better networking relationships if you have more meaningful intentions and goals. Last over here, I've got narrow your scope of who you wanna connect with based on your purpose. And I say this because it will help you feel less overwhelmed about who to connect with. Make the act of networking intentional and meaningful because once you have a thoughtful strategy, the execution will unfold naturally. All right, so let's just say you've looked within and you've identified your purpose for networking. Now you actually need to connect with people. So how do you approach someone you don't know online without coming across like a random stalker? This can be pretty nerve wracking in person and it's completely normal to feel the same about doing it online. So what can you do? Number one, you can be strategic and selective. So don't add people on LinkedIn, for example, for the sake of adding. You have a scope, remember, don't allow scope creep. Focus on quality and not quantity. Some tips that might help tonight in the meetup chat, pay attention to who, you know, um, might pique your interest or pay attention to who's asking really interesting questions. Um, online, look at who's writing really interesting articles or LinkedIn posts or giving, you know, really interesting workshops. Be strategic and knowing who you want to reach out to. Number two, create an association. When you're reaching out to somebody, especially like on LinkedIn, I'll refer to LinkedIn a few times on this chat, explain why you want to connect and be personable about it. If they gave a talk or wrote an article or ran a workshop, reference that. And if they didn't, that's okay. Just, you know, mention where you've met because we're all doing this online. Um, it could be like, you know, hey, it was really good to meet you last night at Ladies at UX. Anchor it down. Not only is this great for the receiver to remember who this is, but it'd be great for you in the future when you look back and think, how do I, how do we meet again? We're at the point where generic introductions on LinkedIn, like, hey, I love to add you to my professional network alone, just doesn't cut it anymore. And number three, where possible, leverage your mutual friends. If there is a mutual friend between you and say a new connection, ask them if they're comfortable to introduce them to you. And take note, if you do get introduced through a mutual friend, take full initiative to follow up and connect. All right, so let's just say you've reached out and connected with someone, hurrah. Now to set up a virtual catch up. So here are some really easy wins for when doing so. Number one, make it really easy for them. Offer a few time slots for a video call and let them pick what suits them best. Aim for about 15 to 30 minutes because people are busy and you wanna show that you respect their time. Once a time has been sent, proactively send the calendar invite with the link. A day before you catch up, check in, make sure they're still okay to meet up. Sometimes last minute changes happen and you might have to reschedule and that's totally fine. Be on the front foot of it. So if you need to reschedule, take initiative and find another time that works. On the day of your catch up, start the session early. Be prompt, get in maybe like five minutes before. Check your video, your microphone, your headphones. And another tip, have a tab open um, you know, on the same desktop with your email or LinkedIn open, depending on how you connect it with the connection, um, in case they are having troubles dialing in, because that can sometimes happen. You want to be on the front foot again of resorting um, you know, with a phone call or maybe another link to use. So let's say everything's going well and you and your new connection are on the video call. What do you talk about? For starters, the easiest thing to break the ice with are commonalities. And this is a strategy that's really useful um, with in-person conversations too. 
I always think back to when I was traveling pre-COVID um, and staying in hostels. And before anyone asks for your name, you're likely to get asked, so where are you from? Because in that context, everyone at the hostel is likely to be from somewhere else. So when you meet someone you know, that you don't know, look for the commonalities, common interests, common experiences, common connections. And right now, given the pandemic, working from home is that commonality between all of us. So leverage that, ask them how they're going with working from home. Next, backgrounds. The one thing we lose from in-person networking to remote networking is the ability to read nonverbal cues easily. But having your video turned on is awesome, right? Um, that at least gives you an ability to read off each other's verbal cues. But having your video turned on also means you're showing off what's behind you. Um, but here's my tip. If it's okay and you're comfortable with it, don't be afraid to show off your home because the gaining of personal knowledge, such as the insight to your home, can lead you to amazing interactions because it humanizes us. This one time I saw a colleague's um, bookshelf behind him and I asked him about the books he was reading and I learned that he actually organizes one shelf on, um, based on to be read books. And that was how we had a really awesome conversation about all the books we bought and never read. <laughs> um, but you know what, I understand that sometimes it's not always um, suitable to share your background. So if you decide to choose a virtual background, that's also okay. But my tip, consciously choose one that you find interesting, such as an interesting pattern, or an illusion, you know, something that's a bit more intentional because this is such an easy conversation starter. Now, lastly, but more importantly, unless you're totally comfortable winging the session, come prepared with questions. Make the most of your time by prioritizing the most important questions first so that if you run out of time, you can scrap out the questions that weren't as important. If you're wondering what kind of questions to ask, refer back to your purpose for connecting. And while you're at it, challenge yourself to ask better questions because better questions can lead to better relationships. I was lucky to attend UX Australia this year and um, one of the presenters was this guy called Dan Brown and he spoke about why questions are a UX designer's most valuable tool. In short, he said you can use questions to you know, do certain things such as empathizing with people by saying, you know, oh, I understand dot, dot, dot and continuing from there. You can use questions to engage with people to say, you know, I'm curious to learn about XXX. Or you can use questions to build trust with people. So, you know, saying, I need your help. I need your advice with something, dot, dot, dot. When you craft your questions, make them really intentional. What do you intend to get out of it? So to summarize, my key takeaways for networking and our current normal. Number one, know your why. Be clear on your reasons for networking and it will reduce the feeling of feeling fake and salesy. Number two, be strategic in your approach when reaching out and connecting with others. Be purposeful and be personable. Number three, play a proactive role in setting up the catch up. Don't make it difficult for the other person. You're asking for their time. And number four, have a conversation strategy. Focus on commonalities and questions. And that's it. It's short and sweet, but I know I've dumped a whole bunch of things to consider in such a short amount of time. So. As an extension of this talk and thought process, if you'd like to dig deeper uh, or if you have any questions and you'd like to bounce that off with me, I've set up some time in the next two weeks for a 15 minute powwows. So I'm gonna post the link in the chat, but head over there, lock it in, and we can continue the conversation there next week. Otherwise, feel free to connect with me via email or LinkedIn and reference that we met tonight here. That's it, thank you. Amazing, thanks Berlin. Um, great tips and, and, and there's some good chatter in the chat as well that's happening. Um, so thanks for that. Mon, uh, you're next. Hi everyone. Oh wait, I've got to share my screen, don't I? That would help. <laughs> this is always the fun part. I'm in sunny Queensland, Berlin. No, I'm just kidding. I'm actually in Melbourne. I would totally buy that, don't worry. I like to pretend that I'm in different locations with my background. It makes me feel like I'm traveling. Okay, so let's get this party started. Right. Here we go. Hi everyone, I am Simone, uh, but everyone calls me Mon, and I'm talking to you today about design portfolios best practice. So. For many of us who graduated from GA or Academy XI, we were encouraged to write a portfolio as part of the course. 
But then all of the new grad portfolios kind of look the same and they speak to the same projects. So how do you actually stand out? And then on the flip side, the more established UX designers with years of experience, what projects are you going to focus on? And do you even actually need a portfolio? So I found this topic really interesting. I was getting some very mixed reviews about portfolios in my uh, more established co-workers and leads. They claimed that um, they didn't really see the value of portfolios and didn't have one themselves. So there you go. Yet most job ads in UX do require one as part of the application. So how do you apply without one? I figured seeming as there were so many opinions, I would UX my talk. I sent out a survey and sat down and had a chat with a few hiring managers as well. I spoke with over 100 UX designers across Australia and Asia currently working in the space. So now a portfolio is only one aspect of the application process, as this whole talk series will attest to. So I'm going to share with you a few guidelines to help you design a portfolio that speaks to the story of your work specifically. So the best way to proceed with any project as Berlin just mentioned, is ask good questions. So why not UX your portfolio? Make a list of companies that you would like to work for and start researching. As the hiring managers, um, as the hiring, ask the hiring man, ask the hiring managers even what they're looking for in a portfolio and make their job easier by highlighting the information that will help them get you in for an interview. Like any good product, know your user and design accordingly. Now, if you're in the middle of getting your portfolio together right now in, pre in preparation for a job, you are not alone. I am also in that camp, not looking for a job, but definitely always leave it to the last minute. And you only update your portfolio when you're applying for a new role. 40% say that it was a scary and nerve wracking experience and less than 50% were confident with the end result. So updating it or creating it when applying for a role can be a great motivator and a great opportunity to ask great questions to hiring managers. But it's also a highly stressful time. So let's just talk through a few things that you can do to help yourself stand out and tell the story of you. So this is my story. What is your unique story? I personally found unique as a third career. After years of broadcast radio and digital marketing, I worked across lots of different industries, music festivals, experiential events, digital art, eventually finding this incredible job where I get to draw pictures and ask questions for a living. It's brilliant. But I'm only a few years into my career. It's my background and soft skills that actually make me the UX designer that I am. So what makes you unique? What is your USP? We hear that a lot, that unique selling point. As UX designers, we're not, we are nothing if not great storytellers. So think about the story of you. If you're new to UX, what are your transferable skills? I worked, work as a, I worked as a radio announcer for many years. So I'm highly trained in interviewing techniques and presenting, which meant facilitating and like presenting user research insights to my team has come rather naturally to me. But what makes you unique? What are your hobbies, your passions? Um, where have you lived or traveled? Maybe not right now, but um, are you into gaming? Are you into growing plants? Are you one of the many people who are baking sourdough bread right now? Allow this to shine through in your designs. And what's your side hustle? Do you like, what do you do aside from work? Do you volunteer? Maybe you run a meetup group? This one is more for my new grads or people with very little experience. I know it's really tough right now to get experience when you don't have any, but employers want real life examples of real life work, not necessarily student case studies. So while you have a little time on your hands, you could potentially freelance. Pop a profile in one of the many freelancing sites like Upwork, TopTel, Simply Hired, um, People Per Hour or the Creative Group. You could volunteer. I personally uh, actually worked with an ethical fashion label that um, was just starting out and it was a cause really close to my heart and it meant that I got some real world experience and a 20% discount across the site. Um, plus a really great reference on LinkedIn, which didn't hurt. And of course, hack. If you have a great idea for a new app or you wanna redesign an app that you use quite frequently and you think could be improved, these are great ways to beef out your design portfolio and share what you're passionate about. So once you know the project, like you've got a few projects together, right? How do you know which one to focus on? I spoke with five hiring managers and they unanimously agreed to focus on just three projects. 
your, your most recent, your most interesting, or say your biggest client, and the project that, learnt, that you learned the most from or you had the biggest challenges on. Then show your working out. Remember in high school maths when your teacher would say like, you've got to show your working out, even if you got the answer wrong, the fact that you were showing your working out and how you got there meant that you would never fail maths. And the same is true for your portfolio. I spoke with one hiring manager in particular who shared with me exactly what he's looking for in a UX portfolio. And this is it, the problem. What is it? What was the business objective and the customer needs? What did you do to solve the problem? What, um, what you did, um, why you did it? Share your insights and research. What was the outcome? And what did you learn? What would you do differently? What was done well? What are your takeaways on this project? Keep it short and simple. We all know as UX designers, people don't read online. So don't make a hiring manager read. That is what an executive summary is for. Hiring managers on average can spend less than three minutes on an application. So whatever you want to write, halve it, and then maybe halve it again. Just like a resume should be no more than two pages, keep your portfolio tight, concise, and to the point. Now, what else should you include? If you read any blogs right now um, on what to include in your portfolio, they always mention things like personal details, a resume, your work philosophy, um, references, qualifications and certificates, awards, artistic flair, skills. However, as you can see, the data on the other hand disagrees. What hiring managers are after are case study examples, examples of your designs and your process and your results. A little bit of education and work history in there as well, but for the most part, it's the process that they're really looking at. And this is an interesting one. We've been asked this a few times at Ladies That UX. And it's tricky because many of us work for organizations that have a sign at NDA as part of our contracts. So how do you speak to projects with sensitive information? Well, as UX designers, we never share participant information, ever, ever, never, ever share private company information. So if you have to speak to a project that contains private information, strip all identifiable information. Alternatively, you could also password protect your portfolio, um, but that can still be a little bit risky. So I think it's best if you were to do that, I would ask permission from the company that uh, you work for. Another alternative is to write it up as a presentation and speak to it in the interview instead. Don't have it publicly available online. Um, but the main takeaway here is follow these little French bulldogs and de-identify, de-identify, de-identify. Okay, some tools. Out of the 100 people surveyed, 31% use Squarespace, 20% have a custom built site, 17% use Medium, 16% use Wix and 12% WordPress. There was also um, other things that were other sites that were mentioned, Joomla, ProcessWire, Cargo Collective, UX Folio, Dribble, Bootstrap. It really is entirely up to you what's going to work best for you and what you like to use, what you're most comfortable with. Uh, hosting wise, 54% uh, are using web host providers like GoDaddy and Crazy Domains, and 30% are using the CMS hosting site. So in short, UX your portfolio. What is your story or your USP? Keep it concise and focus on three and always show your working out. Plus, de-identify any private information. So that's it from me. Um, please feel free to reach out at any time. You can see here, I've got my LinkedIn, my Twitter, and my email. Feel free to ask any questions, and I'm always happy to help you on your journey in any way I can. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mon. That was amazing. Cool. Good job. Cool. So um, next we have Anne Charles. So while she's getting ready to share her slides, don't forget to ask questions in Slido if you need the um, code again, just ping us on the chat and we'll send it through. Thanks. Can you Enjoy. see it? Cool. Um, so hi everyone, I am Ancho and I work as a product design researcher at Xero. So um, I love how Mon went through a lot of the UX portfolio stuff and what I have come across a lot is how do you design a UX research portfolio? So in this talk, I'm trying to tell you a bit of a cheat sheet of like personal experiences that I've used to craft this little cheat sheet. Um, 
<clears throat> so often I get this question, why do you really need a portfolio? The simple answer is you actually don't because not a lot of the UX research jobs actually require it. But what, let me tell you a story that um, I went through back in 2017. So I used to live in New York and I just finished my master's degree and I was on the hunt for my first design research and innovation job. So I had the CV and had a couple of internship experience and I thought, what else would I need, right? Um, and so a company reached out to me and they were like, can you send us your portfolio? I thought, mm, I don't really design anything. What do I show? And so I delivered this um, really weird mix of research and design portfolio work that I had done. It wasn't perfectly structured. In fact, it was far from perfectly structured, it even included a bad photograph of me with post-its and some pixelated screenshots of like a product pitch I'd done for a design innovation class. What it did not have was anything about my unique background, any detail about how I had actually conducted research or demonstration of anything that I'd applied through my research process. Turns out I did not get a job, shocker. But I kept thinking only if they'd given me a chance to interview, I would have been able to explain it all. So the story is that portfolios often are the stepping stone to get yourself noticed and give a chance for the person hiring to get to know you. So for me, the reality hit quite early on. And basically it was, if I wanted to stand out from the crowd, I had to design a portfolio. So basically I'm gonna walk you through some of the tips and tricks I've learned uh, from needing to rework my portfolio multiple times from you know, applying for jobs in New York to Mumbai to especially recently when I moved to Melbourne last year. So number one, stop pretending to be a designer. So hiring, hiring managers in UX research don't want to see pretty pixels and nice wireframes that were designed by another designer. Too many UXers are designing to impress their peers rather than like addressing the real business problem. So stop using the designer's mock-up. If you want to visualize some of your work, use diagrams, charts, or like I do use Canva a lot to create infographics for representing my uh, research findings. So a research portfolio is far less about the final output and more about how you actually got there. So storytelling, and I think this is like a big thing that everyone talks about, and I can't emphasize the importance of storytelling. So think of it like a movie plot, right? So um, I recently read this book um, about resonating with your user, and it was about like, it talked about how you go through a situation, complication and resolution. So your hiring managers don't want to know just about the ending, right? Whatever that feature was created, but want to go on the journey with you. So leverage that. So what is the situation? So basically what led to the research being needed? What was the business problem? This is essentially the backstory for you. And then the rising action is essentially what approach did you take? So what kind of research did you do? Did you do interviews? Did you do a survey? Why did you choose to do that? The climax, which is, you know, often the, the fun part, it's not the, you know, UX wireframe. It's, it's basically, what did you actually find? So you could include quotes without having information about the users. If you can actually, if it's not under NDA, maybe use audio and video clips, possibly even photos of like sticky notes or like how you did your mirror board, essentially do everything you can do to humanize these findings. And the resolution, um, one of the things that happens is, oh, like this is, this is the process, that's it. But what was the impact of it? What are you trying to solve? Take it back to that and tell us about the mistakes. Tell us about the incorrect assumptions that you made, which you wouldn't repeat because we wanna know about how you've actually UX your entire problem. Um, <clears throat> The next bit, so you're not the hero. As much as you would like to think you are, you really are not. The audience is the hero, which is your hiring managers. And it is really important to jump into their shoes. So I read this quote recently, it was like designing a portfolio without an audience in mind is like writing a love letter and addressing it to whom it may concern. I found that very interesting. So think about who you're targeting and what they'd like to know about your story. So. If it's a hiring manager, they wanna see your work and what kinds of value you'll add to their team. And if it's an HR professional, they're looking at like the performance profile and have you demonstrated that success in that profile? So review some of the uh, positions that you're applying for, 
noting sort of like, you know, what are the objectives that they're looking for? Identify some of the projects that have achieved similar objectives or metrics and showcase that in your portfolio. So if you're working, looking at working for a startup, it might be different from when you're looking to work for a corporate tech company. Um, <clears throat> make sure it's skimmable. And I think Mon highlighted that quite a bit as well. So like, nobody has the time. You have one minute to land this dream job. So don't make people skim through it. It's kind of the same thing as when you go through a web page and then scan it quick and then make a decision whether you want to invest more time or hit the back button. So I like to keep them short. So 300 words, perhaps for each case study, two to three max. Um, another thing I would like to talk about is what medium you're going to have it on. So a lot of designers end up having websites and not all researchers are skilled enough to design it or they might be. So, but one of the things that I have learned is that having an online presence is important. That doesn't mean it has to be a website. So if you've designed a PowerPoint presentation, convert it into PDF put it on Dropbox or Google Drive and have a link for it. So you can easily add that to like your uh, job applications. Uh, yeah, don't disclose, disclose confidential information. So, my, so I used to work for an agency back in New York and I was really concerned about how to showcase my work when I moved. So my strategy was basically sanitizing the research artifacts and talking about problems, methods, insights and outcomes without going into specific about which client I worked for or specific solution that we created. I'm also very against the idea of password protected stuff because really nobody has the time. It's annoying for people who have found your website or job application but cannot actually access your portfolio because they haven't found your password. So by adding a password, you're actually adding not just a layer of security but like a layer of friction which could prevent companies from contacting or hiring you. But that's my personal opinion. Um, so another thing is that demonstrate how you worked in a team. So whether it was like a team at university or at a course that you did, or it was when you worked in during an internship or anything like that, talk about how you worked in a cross-functional team, because there is a lot of stakeholder management that you need to do as a UX researcher. So describe how you worked with them. Talk about how you handle the politics clearly kind of state what your role was and ex explain which parts you were directly responsible for. Because most, most often um, hiring managers want to know about how you work within a team. Lastly, don't forget feedback. I cannot emphasize enough. So one mistake I made was when I first created a portfolio, I didn't get any feedback. I was shit. Sorry for my language. But um, then eventually when I was developing it, I got feedback from one of my very good friends who actually has supported me during this call today and is here all the way from Singapore. And she basically told me the truth. So don't be afraid, ask your friends. If you don't have friends who are gonna tell you the truth, get mentors to evaluate your portfolio. Post it on Slack channels or like Facebook groups or you know, some people that you've networked with on LinkedIn after listening to Berlin, there are heaps of people who'd be willing to help you out because everybody likes to help. Um, so all in all, like hopefully, so these are basically my key takeaways. Stop pretending to be a designer, tell the story of your work, define your audience and make sure it's skimmable. Don't disclose confidential information, discuss who you worked with and don't forget feedback. Hopefully, if you're struggling to put together your research portfolio, this will serve as a helpful cheat sheet and get, to, get you to think beyond pretty pixels and wireframes. Uh, yeah, so essentially I've just compiled a few additional resources that I have come across um, you know, in my search for the right portfolio. And there's a case study Madlib, which is just like how your case study should look like. And, um, the book that I referred to, which talks about how to tell your story and some format and examples of how other people have done their research portfolios. Um, and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or feel free to email me. And I work for Zero, and Zero is hiring. So if you're looking for a design job, feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, Amazing. Thank you so much, Anshel. Oh, what a lineup of speakers. Everyone's been doing so well. 
Um, up next, we have Leah. Leah, do you want to start sharing your screen? And don't forget to put questions in Slido because we've got a prize at the end. So you don't want to miss out on that. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, look, thanks for inviting me. And uh, everyone, thanks for coming along. Um, I'm going to try and chat a little bit about how to make online interviews and case studies work in your favour. <laughs> I've recently had to do this myself for a new role at SEEK. Um, and I've also been on the hiring side of interviewing. So I thought I would share a couple of things. Um, first of all, you know, just the obvious things don't change, right? So the interview basics still apply, you know, be on time, research the company, test out your technology, the Wi-Fi signals, your laptop, your microphone, right? Prep and practice your interview questions, have what you need to... So, you know, maybe a, a printout of your resume and your paper and a pen um, and prep your questions. But I'm not going to talk today about those obvious things. You can Google them. There's tons of articles out there. I guess I want to share some things that you might not read about when you try and um, Google this. So the first one around I, I had was about how you engage matters. Um, so so your body language, when you're, when you're listening, you know, you might want to nod and smile to communicate your attention. But also eye contact's a really interesting one because that can be difficult um, online, right? So instead of looking at your interviewer on the screen, you actually want to look actually into the webcam because that would actually be making eye contact with them. Kind of feels weird, but yeah. Uh, pausing before answering questions can help just so you can make sure that the, you know, the interviewer, um, interviewer has finished speaking. You know, that avoids, you know, when there's a lag or, you know, you don't want to, you want to avoid talking over someone. Um, and just try and speak in a conversational voice, just like you would in an actual interview. I think, you know, just have a conversation. The next one I want to chat about is about eliminate distractions. And there's the obvious things like, you know, turning off your email and notifications. But some things you might not think about because we're working at home so much now is things like turning off TVs or closing windows and doors so they don't, you know, bang shut or, you know, cause a problem. Um, you probably want to word up your housemates and your partners um, to interrupt you. Just, just not, yeah, my, I might have had someone at 9 a.m. in the morning walk past in a t-shirt and jocks. You, you, trust me, you don't want that. That's not a good thing. Um, and look, I wanted to spend some time talking about pets and kids because this was really fascinating. Every article I read online was like so anti this, right? And I'll, I'll read you. The, the words online are so strong. Like, if family members, housemates or pets enter the room while you're interviewing, apologise to the interviewer, ask for a few moments, mute your microphone and turn off the camera, then step away to deal with the interruption. It's like, whoa, what is going on? Like, we we it's just like it was so black and white out there i think for me right so i don't mind if i was interviewing someone and someone's cat came in or someone's kids came in i don't mind like and i was actually chatting to a few of my colleagues and uh actually my uh one of my past managers said something really interesting right the kid comes in if you scold them and they you get them out of the room versus they come up, they say hi, you know, you deal with the situation and you, you go, wow, that tells you a lot about someone's personality, I think. And um, I think, don't, I don't think you should shut it down. But, you know, I'm saying this from a really privileged position right now because I have a job. Um, and I've got a feeling, though, if I look back 10 years and I was in this position, you know, I probably wouldn't want to risk it either. But... I think if I didn't get a job because a manager thought this, I probably wouldn't want to work for them anyway. So it's a really tough one. I just, I don't think it's as harsh as what articles online say, but um, I guess it's going to be up to everyone to, to try and make the best judgment. Um, the next one I wanted to chat about was you can take advantage of your space, right? You can make cheat sheets now, right? So as an interviewer, and if they can't see what, what they can't see, right? So you could put, you could take advantage of your space. You could put post-it notes on your computer or behind your computer on the wall. Um, and you can't do that in real life. So the interviewer doesn't know. 
obviously you don't want to overuse them too much because you know you will look odd but um it's something that you can work in your favor in, in, in this sort of environment uh, another one was around planning for when things go wrong um, and I thought this was interesting around just being able to try and get the person's phone number beforehand because if the video cuts out you at least can ring them and either just continue over the phone or organize to re reschedule but you can do it really quickly then and there uh, and the other one is probably worth prepping for some pandemic interview questions I think right now people are probably um, they want to see how you're handling things at the moment so, you know, how have you adapted to working from home? Um, what have you found to be your greatest challenge during the pandemic? Uh, how have you handled the stress associated with it? And what have you learned about yourself? Now, case studies are a little bit different. So I've just got a couple of tips related to case studies. Um, with case studies, I think now, which is different to before is I think, you know, good design really matters. And I wouldn't underestimate this. If you think about when we used to go and do things in person, you know, you'd be standing or sitting there and you might be projecting something on a monitor or a screen. But now the interviewer is mostly just seeing your screen and you're just a tiny little face in that screen, right? So I'd be trying to design the presentation with that in mind, now knowing that that's sort of your hero. And I am not a visual designer, so Canva has been my friend a lot recently. So there's things, there, there are tools out there to make this it's easier. Um, and the last one was around the, the user pres presenter notes. And you can take advantage of these because you can add notes to your slide, which you can read. Um, and you can't do that when you're, when you're doing this in person so much. So, you know, you wouldn't want to read these word for word, you know, and try not to sound like a robot, but um, you can still make it sound like you have a conversation, but you can have those prompts there to, to help you through, through the case study, which you wouldn't normally be able to, to rely on. So just in summary, things that you can, um, I guess, think about that's different in, in this environment and online interviews is how you engage, um, eliminating those distractions, use your space uh, to your advantage, organising that backup phone number, prepping some um, specific questions, really thinking about the design of your case study if you're having to present something. Um, and take advantage of those presenter notes because that's the little thing we can do now too. Um, so thank you all for uh, coming along tonight. Great, thanks Leah, that was so good. I think it's nerve wracking going for interviews, um, you know, just normally having to do this in this kind of new environment um, must be a whole added level of different stress. <laughs> Um, cool. Next up, we have Alexa. She's the last one tonight. So, um, yeah, kick us off, Alexa. Thanks, Sever. Um, now I'm going to share my screen. Um, just give me a sec. Sorry, just give me a sec because my little one just came in. Sorry. <laughs> exactly what Leah was um, referring to before. <laughs> Yeah, for some reasons that just happened right now, right? <laughs> just in okay. time after Leah's talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I'm very glad to be here today and I'm going to talk about taking a design challenge over Zoom. So um, I want to start with my own experience. And two years ago, I decided to move with my family from Colombia to Australia. And the first thing I had in my mind was like, I want to have a UX design job before I walk in Ocelon. So of course that sounds fun, but at the same time, I didn't know how I was going to achieve that goal. So I did everything you already said. I read articles about portfolio CV. I reached out people here through LinkedIn and I asked them for feedback about my CV and everything you hear already. And then I started to apply to multiple roles every day. I was very lucky to have the chance to have multiple interviews over Zoom. And that's what I want to share with you today. So first of all, if you are in a design challenge state of the interview process, it means you already know about the company's 
sorry about that, the company, um, the role and of course the culture and the team that you're going to work with. So that means you already know if this is what you want for your career development and your next step, I guess, and it is a source of motivation. So usually the structure of the design challenge will be like a background, which will be something around the company business model and what they do. And then they will give you a problem, which is very often the domain that you, they, they want you to work in and maybe a new service or improve an experience or just analyzing something that they already have and some extra notes. So these extra notes will be more around what, do, uh, what are they looking for and what are the questions you, they want you to um, answer and then some scope and time frame. So here is where the fun begins. Some initial tips for this. Once you have this design challenge, just have a read and spend some time thinking about what they say. And think about the questions you have. What are the things that you want to know before you actually start to face the design challenge and ask those questions? Then if you don't have the opportunity to create your user, because it usually is like a platform where you need to create a user to be able to go and navigate, just ask for user or a test account or something like that. So you have more chances to know more. The other thing is to think about who is the real user? Are there just one or multiple users? What are the difference between them? And just try to imagine those things and also ask questions about it because that's the main thing. And then read and play with the information you have. And don't forget to have a look on social media and the news of the company because sometimes there is a lot of information and user feedback that will help you to create your solution for the design challenge. Now, I want to share with you the way I presented my design challenge. So it is a framework where I choose to use the design scenario tool. So basically I use the design scenario to explain who the user is, what is this scenario, what is happening, and what are the business and the user goals, expectations and assumptions, and then just create an hypothesis. And once you have this, you can just start to like, like organize your information in these three layers that I am showing you. So you can have your approach, the analysis you did with this approach, and then the solution. So we all know about the design process and the double diamond. And we know that we will not get to the delivery stage. So focus on research, ideate and implementation, which implementation could be just a wireframe or actually some paper, right? When you, where you have the information you need to showcase your abilities. Don't go too narrow too soon because the idea is that you show your capabilities um, and your analysis, the why, of the why behind the what you're doing everything, right? So find a balance between the time frame you have and what you want to showcase. So the design challenge in your framework. So in my specific framework, of course I have the design scenario. And then I started to put all the research information in my approach and analysis, and then the ideation in the analysis and the solution, and of course the implementation in the solution. And then in the approach, just make sure you surface the tool and the methods used to understand the problem. Some of the speakers today talk about diagrams, but you can use something that you have used already, like a user journey map or a blueprint or a mind map, whatever you use and you feel comfortable with, just put it there. It could be a photo or it could be a mirror board or whatever you use for your work. And then in the analysis part, you just need to explain the rationale behind your decisions because that's the way you showcase who you are in terms of um, your abilities uh, from the UX design point of view. And then the solution, it doesn't matter if it is very polished, it doesn't need to be a very high fidelity wireframe or something like that. What it needs is to showcase how you approach and how you analyze and how this information is reflected on your solution. And then just make sure you prepare your presentation. Um, so usually you're asked to send this uh, document um, 
by, via email. So they, they will read it without you. So make sure you think about them, about the hires as a user. And this is the digital tool that you have for those users to understand who you are. Then they will ask you to, um, they, they will ask you to take them through the, the design task over Zoom. And here I just put some of the examples. It is right now very blurry, but what I want to show you there um, is basically that I have like a design scenario here where I explain everything I just told you. And then some sketch and things that I was just thinking while I was, um, yeah, just going through my design challenge. And here you can see very clear, very clear but it is, there is a journey map. And this is like what I analyze in the current tool that they have and then what I was proposing. So just make sure you, you show your abilities and the way you work. And just um, some tips to document your design tags because it is like, it has a couple of things. First, the thing you send for them to have a read when you are not with them and then how you present the design task. So for the document, I really encourage you to um, highlight the process Remember that you're showcasing your capabilities. Um, don't forget to be consistent with what they already have. Just make sure you reuse patterns and design elements um, because that also talks about how interested you are and how, and how much effort you put into like analyzing what they give you, right? And then um, just add notes and make sure you are like pointing explicit, explicitly to the point where you are recommending improvements or just saying, what do you want to change and why? And tips to present your design task over Zoom. So first, choose the format. Um, it is very important because you need to feel comfortable with this presentation. So choose whatever it works for you. And think about this design challenge as a workshop facilitation and Think about if you haven't done like a remote workshop before, this is a very interesting way of starting um, because you need to create some strategies to keep them engaged with you. Plan ahead, you will have some time and for sure you have different sections in your presentation and you have maybe in mind, where do you want to spend more time or less time? So make sure you make time for the things that you think are more relevant in your work and show your process. Of course, focus on explain why, and try to, uh, don't go straight away to the design because um, if you don't explain them, how do you get there? They will not understand exactly how you think, right? How do you solve problems? And think about this on your favor because as it is remote, now you can be wearing the clothes you want, you could be in the place you want to be and just drink the tea that makes you feel comfortable so just think about this as something that you can use in your favor to feel more com confident and, and just uh, do it the best way you can. And that's it. I would like to connect with you on LinkedIn. So here are my details. Thank you. Great, thank you, Alexa. Awesome. Wow, thanks for all the speakers for sharing all your um, knowledge and tips with us today. I think that was really useful um, if for anyone who's kind of, I guess, not even if you're looking for a job right now, but in the future as well. Um, we're going to take a quick break to set up for questions, but um, so come back in about two minutes um, and we're going to use Slido. So I'm just going to go back to sharing my screen. Um, yeah, so we've got a few questions in there, but um, now's a good time to grab a refill um, and come back in two minutes. Cool. And I'm gonna play some lounge music while we wait. We should do this for every meetup we run now, ever. Just saying. The, the launch music, you mean? Oh, Yana's got a question. Um, how to enter Slido? I'm just going to yeah. add it into the chat. Cool. Thanks, Berlin. I'm trying to work with um, two laptops, so it's a... Uh... Okay. 
Maybe I should play some clapping noises next time, Harveen. <laughs> well, I mean, I could clap myself, like, come on. I can join you. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to give one more minute um, before we kick off. So I can see questions coming in. Uh, don't forget to vote as well. Cool. All right. Now I'm going to try and do a fade out. Oh, I think that worked really well. <laughs> cool. All right. Awesome. So let's go to Q&A. Um, this is a, the first one is a question for Anchal. Can we see examples of good UX research portfolios? Oh, tough one straight away. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Mine's really bad. <laughs> I think you had some resources in your slide before, so maybe we can share that later. But I guess if you had a top one um, off the top of your head, do you recall any that um, you know would be a good one to look at? I don't recall a single one, but yeah, that's I fine. think there's been different elements of um, different portfolios that I have liked. And, um, and I don't want to jump into another question, but I just thought that was very relevant, but I think it's just, um, you should find elements from different portfolios and get inspired by them. There's no, like, I don't know if there's one person who has perfected it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's, I'm not going to jump into another question. No, I mean, that's great advice because everyone's experience will be different as well. So, um, awesome. Let's move on to the next one. Um, for a case, this is from Monica, for case studies for our portfolios, is it best to write it and publish on Medium or write it on your portfolio and why? Um, I think you can do both. You can um, publish it as a case study on Medium, which means that because uh, Medium is like a social media sort of page in a way. So you're going to, I've posted a few um, of my case studies on Medium and then places like the UX, there was like a UX um, page that started to like push my articles out. So I think that's really useful, but I would also probably like take uh, screenshots of that and put that onto your private site. I would never recommend, you know, we're sort of talking about like minimizing uh, effort for hiring managers. So I would never recommend like another link or pushing somebody to have to go and find more information, like put it in front of them as much as you possibly can and keep it super brief. Cool. Thanks, Mon. Um, does anyone else have anything else to add to that? I know um, my my kind of portfolio is on Notion, so I've seen a few people use that as well. Um, so I think the the platform doesn't really matter as long as you know, like you said, my, it's accessible and in one place, and um, people can get to it easily. That's really what matters, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, I think Mon as well. Like if you've got already some articles on Medium, that like I say, you don't want to have a like a resume or portfolio with like three links of three articles. So if you can combine that, but it definitely doesn't hurt to say, you know, add your link to your Medium account because I'd go and look at that to see what other things you have. Because if you've sparked my interest enough, I probably will want to go and see what other things you were talking about. So I think you could link off that way too. Yeah, great one, Leah. Cool. Anyone else have anything to add? 
awesome. Okay, let's move on to the next one from Harveen. Um, I have noticed in portfolio reviews by mentors, there is some emphasis on about me page, the personality, um, standout shine factors, how best to show that? I have some examples because I saw this Ooh. and I prepared. So actually part <laughs> of my um, UXing my talk, I got people to send me great portfolios that they got a lot of interest, like they, they got a lot of enjoyment out of and why. And I've got three here I wanted to just show you. Now, I don't know about the About Me page. I think that's kind of unnecessary. I feel like your personality would shine through from the designs, not necessarily a full About You page. Um, you can have an About Me page, but I just want to show you what I'm talking to. So I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, do oh, it now. Can I actually? Sorry. Yes. Okay, cool. So this one is my favorite. Look at how fun this is. Okay, maybe I need, do I need to make this bigger? Or is that okay? Yeah. So, oh, look at Peggy Way. Um, she's not a unicorn. She's a unique corn. So this is showing her personality. You can see the color. Again, she's focused on three projects, one, two, three, and then you can view the case study and then she's got some more work there as well if, if you would like to. And then look at this, let's connect. Wonderful. So that's, I love this one. Vedran as well, uh, I love this one. Like this is really showing like Vedran's personality, his artistic flair. Um, and you can see here the sort of the color, the, the font, all of these things are going to show you what your person, like sort of about yourself and about that personality. So it's not necessarily, I'm a UX designer and this is my process. Like I showed you before, my little squiggly lines, um, of how I got to UX shows a bit of my personality um, on my portfolio. And then, um, and then this is another sort of different design. Again, nice clean lines, lots of white space. And again, one, two, three projects. Notice how we've all got this consistency happening here. Um, a little bit of, there's an about me as well. So it's not something you can't do for sure. Um, but yeah, I would limit too much, uh, too much copy, but see, that's nice. Nice and easy to um, see who the person is, a little bit about themselves. I wouldn't, yeah, go, I wouldn't worry too much. I feel like you should, like, if you're really looking at your unique selling points, like your history, what you're about, what are your passions, what are you interested in, just write it all down, put on some post-it notes. We love post-it notes. Um, and then start to collate, uh, like, who you are and what you're about and let that shine through in your designs. Like Peggy with her corn. Hilarious. I love it. So I guess you're referring to more like in, infusing it throughout your whole portfolio as opposed to like having it on a specific thing. Does, um, does anyone else have to share maybe um, uh, Anshal, Leah or yeah. yeah. I have something. Um, I think like um, one of the things I do agree is that you need to kind of visualize it because don't put too much information. But when I remember a couple of years back, um, I know a couple of years back, just two years back, but I came across um, this portfolio where um, someone had included FAQs and I actually almost like, I, I got inspired by that and added it to my portfolio for a bit. Um, and so the whole idea was that they wanted to, if someone wanted to know more about them, so just like frequently like interview questions that you asked, they just wrote a little blurb about each question. So that's a good way to sort of be like, oh, what, you know, specific questions that are answered. So it was something like, how do you work collaboratively with um, developers as a UX designer? And um, the person spoke, had a little blurb about how that happens. And um, just some of the tools that you use, or I can't quite remember exact details, but I think the FAQ sort of, format was an interesting way to be uh, to talk about who you are rather than just a cookie cutter about me page i would also add something to anshal's point which is to what mon said about looking at what your usp is put it together and then like what mon did put it in front of hiring managers right like get their feedback because there's no one right way so mon showed um three examples using websites which is totally fine 
and mine is not a website. So I couldn't get away with just an empty page. So I've played around with it, but I put it in front of different hiring managers to say, is this all right? And I got feedback to, you know, cut out this, cut out that, also finding out why I did what. So unfortunately, there's no cookie cutter uh, answer for this. But if you have a gut feel of what you want to put in, um, go with it and then get feedback because you'll never know until you actually get feedback. Great point, Bruin. I think um, it's, it can be daunting um, to approach people to, especially hiring managers, just to ask for feedback. Um, but, you know, you've done it, so. <laughs> oh, big point there. It is daunting to reach out to hiring managers. That's not a lie. But, like, that's the reason why something like networking is so powerful. I know some people think, ugh, networking, I don't want to do it. But networking is the thing that makes those kind of reaching out to someone when you actually need their assistance less difficult. And you can't make it instant. You know, it feels more fake when it's too instant. So it is a long game, a long-term game. But I reached out to a lot of hiring managers because I befriended them way, way, way long time ago before I was even putting it down a portfolio. So um, it does pay back in dividends. Just, you know, it takes a bit of time. Berlin, you made, you made me think of something, Berlin. Like, it's so, like, if you don't know any hiring managers, like, it's just going and randomly searching LinkedIn for managers and then asking them for help, probably, well, it might not work, right? So it might. It's, but one of the other things that you made me just think of then is if you know friends who are working in the field, like, if Mon came up to me and said, hey, Leah, I actually got this friend who's just trying to, like, fine-tune... Uh, the portfolio they're not really getting much hits do you mind having a look at it automatically you've been able to get into hiring managers time and a bit easy like in an easy way in a connected way and you might get more luck in um, yeah. it's less daunting right just to go randomly go to strangers but use your networks that you have to see if they can help you with their bosses and you might totally. find that people will help you more than you think I'm totally with Leah. Leverage your mutual friends, everyone. Seriously, it's less awkward that way. All right, that's a great that's tip for you. Awesome. Um, because my experience was so different, I didn't know, like I didn't have friends or anyone here. So I think what helps me was my introduction. I was just explaining why I was reaching out. Uh, so I'm from Colombia. I'm doing this. I'm planning to move in six months or whatever. And then I ask them questions. So of course, not everybody replies. But then when you see that someone reply, you you get more like the confident that they will actually help you. <laughs> yeah, great one, Alexa. I have just one more point to add over there is that um, there's a lot of like Slack channels and Facebook groups and um, LinkedIn groups, which have specific like portfolio review whether it's a you know like a like a slack bit for portfolio yeah. or if it's like a monthly thread that happens around portfolio reviews so i think if if you know you can't find the right people in the industry those are great ways to leverage it like leverage these platforms and you don't have to necessarily ask them to go through your entire portfolio, but maybe ask them, oh, hey, what do you think about my About Me page? Say, for example, specifically include just a screenshot and the link or something of that sort. So it's a bit more specific rather than asking them to be like, how is my portfolio? So then it becomes a bit more generic. So that's... Yeah. Good one, Anshal. Like be specific about what kind of feedback you're looking for. Um, always helps, I think, even outside of portfolio, just in general. Yeah. Um, also, I think, like, I guess one of the good things that came out of, um, you know, um, having to work from home and being more connected virtually is, um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the ADP lists, um, dot org website as well. They're doing a lot of mentoring sessions and portfolio reviews. So that's a good one to kind of get onto as well. Oh, uh, yeah. And I saw someone else post it in the chat too. Thanks, Kriti. Um, cool. Okay. That Great question, Harveen, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna switch back and let's go to the next one. Um, this one's for Leah, given the pros and cons of online interviews, how do you think hiring managers maybe, maybe apply more or less understanding? I put a new bulb in this one. Are you meaning, do you think, are you asking whether you think hiring managers might, might be more or less understanding it? <laughs> <'Cause>... <laughs> 
what's going on right now. I knew, I knew we have nakedness and it was true. Uh, I think, yeah, I think, I think people are, I think managers probably are more understanding at the moment. I would say it's, maybe good managers are more understanding at the moment. So I think people who have teams know how hard it is right now for everyone in their team, let alone the people who are trying to look for work. So, <laughs> um, so I think that's probably a good thing. I think, um, yeah, being able to connect us with someone personally and, and like and have a conversation, just connect that way is going to be really meaningful in, a, in an interview that you can feel like you can work with the person as opposed to, you know, anything more formal as well. I think that's really important too. I don't know if that answered your question though, Victoria. Yeah, um, feel free to unmute yourself, Victoria, if you wanted to expand more on it, but I guess it's, that's a tough question. <laughs> Sorry, no, um, yeah, it does. I just, being someone who's um, in the kind of job hunt at the minute, it's reassuring. Um, to hear that, thank you. Okay. Cool, thanks Leanne Victoria. Um, next one's from Anna. Uh, I've just started my job hunt as a UX designer, and super excited and nervous. Welcome Anna. Um, what are some tips to stay productive, motivated and mentally healthy? Ah, so does anyone want to kick off that question? I love to, if that's okay. Um, yeah, I'm a big fan of peer support groups. I know it sounds really formal, but what really it is, is just having um, a group of friends that sometimes your friends are not on the same level with you when it comes to your career development. And that's totally okay. Like my high school friends and I, we just, we don't really talk about careers. We talk about silly things, right? And that's okay. But it really helps to have a group of friends. It can only just even be one or two people with you that are kind of on the same, I guess, trajectory, have same goals and to connect with them. So I have two girlfriends. I think they're actually in the audience right now. Um, but I met these two through meetups and we started off just being acquaintances. But this year we've taken a really big interest in career development. And um, that little like group between the three of us has been amazing for the really bad days, for the really slow days, for the days that when the pandemic really got to us and we just couldn't hack any more Zoom catch ups. Um, or meetups and we felt like we were missing out and so forth. So I feel like leverage a peer support group um, and the catch is you've got to really find out if they're on the same direction with you because I think that will make or break one um, and that keeps you going even when the days are really hard. I will be keen also to share what I do. So to me Time management is very important. It is something, it's a skill that I have been, like I guess, improving during this pandemic. Um, so just plan your day, think about what works best for you. Is it working more in the morning? And yeah, just try, try to make it easy for you. And just think about yourself and find out where is your energy coming from? And what are those things that you should keep doing even though you're in a lockdown time? So if it is doing some exercise or meditation or just uh, catch up with your friends or have a beer on Friday, <laughs> whatever it is, just keep doing that because that's the source of your energy. And yeah, that, that's what has been helping me during this lockdown to be productive and healthy. Yeah, I'd like to add on to Alexa's point about being productive and balanced. Like, so lots and lots of meditation. I do so much meditation right now just to try and chill um, and getting out there and being active, but also um, being productive. So um, similar to, because you are new to UX, getting some real life experiences. So maybe a bit of freelancing projects or um, having a look at that um, website that, um, you know, like that, that, that idea that you wanted to update um, a, a, an app or whatever it is, like have a couple of projects that you're working towards to have some real life experience that you can speak to when you do get those interviews, because it will eventually happen. You will have those interviews and now it's just a great time for you to prep and prepare and, you know, do all the Zoom meetings, connect with all of us. You've got all of our details. We're happy to help you in the process as well. Um, and just know that you're supported and um, it will happen. Hey, Mon. Mm -hmm. Just to add a lens to this, 
I think it's okay for people um, to not be productive. Like, I think it's a really good time to be kind on yourself. There's less jobs out there. There's more people who probably possibly aren't working. It's a super time, hard time on whether you have families with kids, whether you live by yourself and all this sort of stuff, right? So I think, you know, do what you can for sure, but don't, I think it's important to not, I guess, beat yourself up if you're not kind of doing what you think you need to do or what you ex try and expect of yourself. I think it beats, just to reassure you that a lot of people are, uh, this is, this is, well, it's unprecedented times, isn't it? So it's, uh, yeah. I just wanted to add that. So if you are feeling like you're not being productive, I think you're not alone. And I don't think you need to push too hard sometimes. Just you know, give yourself a break as well. Yeah, I love that. And I think um, something that I will add really quickly before we move on is Alexa brought up something that was quite, I think, quite unique in that it's okay to not be productive when things are really difficult, like right now. But Alexa brought up a point, which is having a um, kind of a routine or a schedule does kick you out of bed at like eight o'clock in the morning, which kind of does make you feel a bit productive, but at least having that routine does stimulate some momentum. But if you get out of bed and do everything right and you still don't feel great, it's okay. Life will move on. And just to Leah's point, be kind on yourself, but routine does help keep you mentally sane. Awesome point, everyone. I think it sounds like, you know, um, like you kind of just have to do what you what's best for you if that means being really productive or that means taking time off I think we're all just kind of following our own kind of um, ways of coping I guess so thanks for sharing everyone um so I just want to quickly uh go to some questions that were in the chat that were missed so um it was in the chat not in Slido so I'm going to go to that quickly um there's a question from Ray about being an introvert um, and having to network. Is there a key, I guess this is one for you, Berlin, like is there a key point that help you get started networking as an introvert? I think a good way to view this, I know the extrovert introvert argument has been brought up in networking. Um, the way I look at it is if you identify yourself as primarily introverted and you think this is really hard, um, Networking can be viewed as a skill, like something you can learn. Um, like I said, there are conversation strategies, right? So like, I know it sounds really like not natural, but the more you practice it, the more it begins to feel natural. So it's a skill. Whereas for a lot of extroverted people, I would assume it will feel more natural to them. So I think maybe look at it that way. Think of it as a skill that maybe right now you don't feel so comfortable with and you need to get better with it. Um, that's one way to look at it, but I myself am more of an extroverted, so I recognize my answer may be a bit biased. So in terms of having a trigger, I never really had a trigger. I've been making friends with randos my whole life. So I just recognize that not everyone's like this. So, you know, but yeah, if you have more questions, hit me up or we can chat more. Thanks, Berlin. Does anyone else have anything to add about, I guess, networking as an introvert? Cool. Right. Okay. No, it's fine. I think it's just because I can't, I don't have my video on, so it's hard to tell, um, you know, with the pauses and whether it's too long or too short. Anyway, um, I also have another Zoom question, and this one's for Mon from Ola. Aside from visual design, how do we show our UX process and working out without being just like every other UX portfolio? Yeah, so I spoke to that in the, the chat. Um, I felt like the when I got the hiring manager, Rob um, gave us the extra insights. Sorry, I'm just bringing up my slides. So essentially, um, totally get what you're saying about maybe like focusing on um, your designs. Whereas I would disagree if you really want to show you're working out, the designs is probably the least thing that you're going to focus on. You want to be focusing on what was the problem, um, hold on, I might actually, do you want me to quickly share this slide, if that's okay, Eva? Just so maybe I can write it down. Go for it. So I thought this was a nugget of gold when I got this. It was the best. Um, so this is exactly, <laughs> eventually it'll start. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so the problem, the business objectives and the customer needs what you did. So that's your designs there. Why you did it. What are your research, your insights? 
what was the outcome? So what were your results? How did you move the needle on actually reaching uh, on solving that problem? And what did you learn? What went well? What would you do differently? Future iterations. So here you can see that's quite a brief amount of focusing on the designs. Uh, and that was what I got from one of the hiring managers, uh, which I thought was great advice. But does anybody else have anything that they could add to that? Mona, I can jump in. The what you did bit, like I think someone else asked this as well, like where do you add things like stakeholder management and soft skills? Like I could, I don't think what you did is just the designs. I think what you did could be like that you ran, you know, this design studio with these stakeholders and then you did this and then you had to negotiate this and you can, you can put in the tools that you used as well. I also um, have come across this power framework, which is, um, it's basically this idea of like how you start if you if you're looking at like you know how to how to showcase that work so it's kind of like the pro I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure but it's like project objective work and result and reflection and I feel like the reflection is such a big part of it and um we often forget that so yeah just um I think you can look it up it's just called the power framework by it was um, it was someone who writes a lot about UX portfolios. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll post the link afterwards. Um, so. Thanks, Ajay. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Okay, let's move on to the next question from Ladan. Uh, I'm not sure which specific UX path I want to follow. I've introduced myself as a UX UI designer in my portfolio. Is it okay for now for a graduate student? I'd love to hear Leah's take on this. As someone who hires, I, I would love to know. Um, I think it depends what role you're going for. If you're going for a UX designer, I would call yourself a UX designer. But if you're going for a product designer role, perhaps call yourself UX and UI designer. Yeah, I think labels is a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, there's, you know, there's so many different interpretations of what those titles mean in different companies. Would you agree, Leah? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Especially product designer can mean so many different things in different companies, for sure. Yeah. So I guess um, UI kind of flags that you're doing interface design. So you need to have more of a design background or a visual design background to be able to do that. Yeah. Hope that answered your question. Um, Uh, might move on to the next one. Um, so how to stay persistent with a job search when there hasn't been much response? Oh. Does anyone want to take that one on? I, I think it's kind of, yeah, cool. You can, you can talk about it ever, I think, as well. No, I was going to say it was, it was similar to a question that we had earlier, but yeah, go for it, Anshal. I think um, like one thing that I realized when I moved to Australia, I, I didn't move with a job and it took me a while to get a job. And to one of the things that I practiced, and it's not just necessarily um, you need to practice that in COVID or outside of COVID, just generally, is turn off your notifications after a certain time. So I had this very, very bad habit of um, having LinkedIn notifications on my phone and at 10 o'clock in the night, I would be like, you know, looking at jobs and looking at things and trying to do things. So that's, that's one of the things to not do. And I think the persistence really comes from just realize that every job that you are being rejected for is the not the right job. I think every time people think of rejection as, oh, there's something wrong with me. No, it's probably that was not the right fit. And when you find the right fit, it's going to be perfect. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Anshel. Does anyone else want to chip in with that? I think like not having, again, I'm speaking on this from someone who has a job, so I don't know the feeling of the person who's written this question. Um, but if I can try and empathize with this, to Anshel's point, give yourself a break because it's so tiring to be in that state of mind 24 seven. So I mean, Anshal called up turning off your notifications, but take a few days if you can, if you can afford to, just to not look at it because you'll always, like just like a weekend, you always come back refreshed. So that is something 
you know, to consider if you can. So I understand I'm saying this without knowing a lot of things I'm assuming, but a break can always do wonders because that is a very tiring mental state to be in the whole time. And the job market is slowly picking up again, so. Yeah, thanks, Berlin. Um, it's, yeah, it's, it's tough um, right now when uh, I guess, yeah, there's this, it, I think it's more like you know all the things that you have to be doing or you should be doing doing them is not is a whole different thing as well um so thanks for the question um sorry ever before you move to the next one oh, yeah sure mm -hmm. i think a good tip and when you when you feel like confident to ask uh it would be maybe to ask for feedback uh sometimes they give you good feedback or they just say oh I mean, we're looking for someone who has more experience in UI or something. So you know what exact what exactly happened or if you need to improve something that helps as well. Yeah, great. Thanks, Alexa. Ever you've muted oh. yourself. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thanks, Alexa. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to, um, yeah, just, just let me know if I'm muted and talking. Um, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Jane, uh, so many jobs emphasize UI. Any recommended UI challenge groups for beginners? How um, do we tackle this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is really interesting. There, there are a few groups that I know of. I can't recall what they are, um, but I Cyprus? guess like newsletter groups or email groups um oh kens has just posted in chat um ui challenges on dribble oh amazing thank you i don't have the chat open so i can't see that but yeah if anyone has any oh i see a few coming in as well daily ui so thanks for answering the question for us yeah please help us out feel free to share any knowledge that you have knowledge sharing is tops Awesome. Okay, let's move on to Monica. So I'm just conscious of time as well. So it's 7.35. Um, we're meant to, I guess, wrap up soon. Um, but feel free to stay around. We'll probably stick around here to about eight. Um, so I'll just keep going through the questions. But if you have a specific question that you want to see answered, make sure you vote because that brings it to the top of the page. Um, so I'll go on to Monica's. Um, any advice on how to break the can't get a job because of no commercial experience, but I can't get commercial experience because I can't get a position cycle. <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, in saying this, definitely take Leah's advice. I think that was really great advice. Just um, take it slow right now. But if you do have a little bit of motivation and you want to get that experience, um, there are freelancing sites. There are, um, I, like I mentioned before, I worked with a company that I was really interested in, which was an ethical clothing label. I know there's so many volunteer opportunities uh, at the moment. Check out Seek Volunteer, um, little plug there, um, so that you can uh, see some other volunteer opportunities uh, To I know that I've reached out to cool companies that I really liked like um, uh, that I wanted to potentially work for but they didn't really have a budget so I did some free work for them I'm not advocating working for free but just to get a little bit of experience up um, and to beef out your portfolio um, and one thing I saw which I thought was really cool was a, a friend of mine actually redesigned a couple of apps that they used all the time um, which is a really lightweight way to sort of see how the company has done the UX process and then sort of adapt or iterate on that and and where they would probably take it um, um, and I know that they got, uh, that was really impressive to hiring managers and they were hired pretty quickly because of that. So there's sort of like that freelancing, there's volunteering and then yeah, hack your own. I have one more to add over there. Um, so like when I was applying um, for jobs, when, when I graduated, I, I just had university work or like something from my internship. And I was really keen on working with this one company. So what I did was take an aspect of what they do and create a case study based on that. So just like redesigning it. But if you tailor it to like one of the companies that you're really, really keen on working on, it seems a bit more tailored and you also end up having a great case study for your portfolio. So that's a good way to do it. 
Awesome. Um, I also, someone asked me this question on LinkedIn as well. Um, in terms of like, if you're going down the volunteer path, um, Volley is a really good website to look at projects. Cause then I guess the problem with doing conceptual work is that you don't have the constraints that you get in a real life business. Um, so yeah, if you do, you're doing like volunteering for not-for-profit, you know, you're not really getting paid, but um, if you can, you know, if you're in a position that allows you to do that, um, then Volley is a good resource to have. Uh, does anyone else have anything else to add to this? Okay, great. Um, I'll go on to the next question from Kenza. And oh, this one's from Anshel. How do you show your UX research style or philosophy in your portfolio of the case studies are around 300 words or shorter? <laughs> I think it's through like infographics or visualization. That's how I would do it. It's so it doesn't have to be that everything you are talking about is written down. Start by writing it down and then just strip it back and see how you can visualize that. So like a diagram or like um, an illustration that might, you know, encompass everything. And um, if, you know, it's harder to like think of um, if you don't have output, how do you do it? So. Um, even even really simple like um, boxes and even if you use like a mirror board sometimes that could really help. So just map it out on a mirror board, take a screenshot and add that as an image and then write down what that is. It's kind of just essentially reducing that sort of cognitive load someone would have when reading through your portfolio. So um, and like think about other ways that you know you would want to talk about the same thing. So um, if it's, if it, you know, if you don't want to illustrate it or anything of that sort, just break it down into points. It's also just about like, it's even simple things like making something a title and having a little pointer below that, that makes a huge difference compared to like writing an entire paragraph. That's, that's huge, I think. Amazing, thank you. Um, we also have another question from Kenza. Do you think that three case studies are enough for senior designers and how would you translate your design knowledge and soft skills like stakeholder management? Well, yeah, I spoke to five hiring managers and they really pushed that three was enough. Um, for a senior designer though, I'm not sure. Leah, what do you think about this one? I don't want to read more than three. No, no, no. I'm not going to read three. Like I've got like how many minutes? No, no. I think I, I, I'm flippant, but um, unless you think there's like you've had projects which are completely different each time and there's some reason like you need to show something totally different, I don't know whether you need more than three. I think from a senior designer perspective, I think also I can kind of get a combination of things like from your case studies, what's your process, like how long you've been in the industry for, where, you, where you've been working, you know, how long have you stayed in jobs as well? Like there's probably a few things sort of stick together when, from a senior designer perspective. Just really quickly as well, I think this has a lot to do with the fact that humans are quite, um, we're biased towards the rule of threes as well. So it's not like we're saying three because it's the, it's the way it should be, but I think we're geared towards threes for so many reasons, including it's the number of which from the, min the minimum number that we need to notice a pattern and distinguish things from each other. Um, so perhaps we're geared to look at it that way, but not necessarily like it's because of the way it is, you know what I mean? So keep that in mind. So um, I just wanted to add that in because I thought that was really fascinating when I learned about why three. <laughs> and I think just to the converse of that, I think if you only have two, then that's not going to disadvantage you either. If you can lay out properly, like, this is a problem we're solving, this is the totally. tool, this is what I did. That's, that's often more than other people do. I also think that like it's just a stepping stone to get you get, get I hate using get your foot in the door but yeah that's like literally what it is and um, that's because if you a lot of um, senior roles or just in general design roles or research roles will have you present a case study or have a chance to actually present some of your work during an interview process so you can leverage that like presentation or that interview process to explain the details of it. So it's just a snapshot of it, not necessarily your entire career on a website. 
Yeah, a hundred percent. A few of the hiring managers I spoke to actually said specifically that the portfolio wasn't what would necessarily get you the interview. It's one of the many tools that you can utilize, uh, but it's not the whole thing. So it's your resume, it's you know your experience, it's how you probably even present yourself. There's many, many elements to it. Like we discussed today, networking all the way through to um, the, the design challenge and, and interviewing online. Ooh, one more thing to add, sorry, so many ideas. Anshal brought this up and to Mon's point, um, your portfolio, is not the only thing that may guarantee you an interview. So other things other than what Mon just mentioned, another thing that does get into consideration, I've heard because I spoke to a few hiring managers too when I was doing my portfolio, um, was what Anshal mentioned, which is you need to have an online presence. And now let's just say you don't have an online portfolio. If you have an online LinkedIn portfolio, that still counts. And so, you know, don't underestimate people checking your LinkedIn. Do the stories match what you're saying in your portfolio? Does it match what's on LinkedIn? Are you saying the truth? Are you lying? Are you beefing it up? Make sure the narrative is the same. Make sure your brand is the same. So there are lots of different elements that may perhaps land you that interview. So just be conscious of that. Good morning, really. And thanks everyone for um, answering that question. I think that was a really good discussion to have. Um, so we're just approaching 7.45. Um, and I, I, so I know we've still got lots of questions. So what we'll do is that um, I might take note of these questions and we'll send it out to the speakers and see if um, we can put it in a work document or something and then send it out to everyone later. I'm sorry we're running out of time um, for questions as well. Um, but thanks everyone for doing this. and. What we'll do next is just, I'm just gonna wrap up a few things. Um, before we wrap up, I'm just going to pick the winner for the Adobe prize. Um, so give me a second. We need that chill right. again. <laughs> Forgive my um, technical issues again. <laughs> I don't know what happened to my, um, slides. Oh, here they are. Okay, cool. Let me just share again. Um, okay, this is fun. So, okay. Um, the winner uh, for the prize is Harveen. I hope you're still here. <laughs> um, I'm sorry if you're not. Uh, and you feel free to unmute yourself if you're still here. So I'm still working with two yes, screens. I'm here. Oh, hi, Harveen. So um, we were really lucky to get a uh, sponsorship from Adobe. Um, so you've won a year's worth of Adobe, um, the Creative Cloud subscription. Fantastic. Um, awesome. Okay. Cool. Congratulations. Congrats. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that, that was just a, a random thing. I'm sorry. That was not as... Um, <laughs> I didn't have, like, something to hand over to you right now. <laughs> so... Yeah, so I'll get in touch with you after um, to get your details um, to send it through. That would be great. Um, cool. And just before we wrap up, so I'm just going to flag we have a next event coming up in November. So keep an eye on our meetup page and our social channels um, to get notified. Um, that's the link to our meetup page. I'm sure most of you would have found it, um, although you wouldn't be here today. Um, also, there is a conference coming up called Web Directions Product um, that's in November, uh, and we are partnering with them as a community partner again this year. So more details to come, but that's coming up, and I think um, we'll send out more details over uh, Meetup or in our social channels, so keep an eye out for that as well. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, yeah. We had so many great, great speakers and great questions today. And like I said, we'll, we'll have a look at the questions and try and get some of those answered. I'm sorry we ran out of time for that. Um, Ever, just, can you yeah. do us a favor? Could you hop back to the slide that has um, all the, that had all the speakers? Uh, we just had someone in the chat, one, one if I was asking. There you go. I just did, I promise I asked her, I asked you. Thank you. I, I need to work out how to use multiple screens. <laughs> Be kind to yourself, girlfriend. You did great. Thanks. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. So if um, you don't have anything else, anything else coming up in the chat. So yeah, cool. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your night and we'll see you at the next meetup.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Just gonna stop the recording. Uh, oh.